Biology from Duke University, but he's an Iowan, and he got his BA at Drake University. We're delighted when people get their education in Iowa, go away other places, and then come back. He's taught at uh, Grinnell College since 2012, and I asked him, you know, what, so what does he think about teaching at Grinnell College, and had he taught undergraduates before? And, uh, no, he hadn't so much taught undergraduates before, and he really loves uh, teaching those students at the college because they're very eager to learn, as we know. And he especially likes teaching the pharmacology uh, course, much of what uh, you're going to hear in his uh, talk today, in part because it's not just about the, the chemistry and the biology, but because it's about society. He has a wife and two children, one in fifth, one in second grade. He's, uh, he's from southwest Iowa, God's country, Woodbine. <laughs> and uh, for fun, he runs, he listens to music, and he coaches soccer. And here's the new deal. Here are the reminders. If you're using uh, a tea coil, now's the time to turn it on. If you've got a cell phone with you, please mute or turn off. We, Josh and I talked about this, and we think we're going to go with the strategy of, if you have a question, raise your hand, Josh will, you can just say your question as loudly as you can, and Josh is going to repeat the question. We're going to try that, okay? Which negates the need for me to run around you for, to wait for me and you to figure out how the heck this microphone fits in front of you. Okay, so we're going to try that. Um, good. Josh, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Let me check. Is this good microphone? Okay. If it, if I slap it, then it ceases to, you, you cease to be able to hear me, just let me know. Thank you, Janet, for uh, the introduction. And I also want to encourage you, maybe Janet said this, maybe not, um, there's a little bit of a buzz. Should I move it just a little bit? Is that better? I'll move a little bit more. Is that? Can you still hear me now? And less fuzzy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, feel free to flag me down in the middle. You don't have to wait till the end. I'll take your questions at any time today. So that way you don't have to try to remember it. We'll just get, get to the bottom of it right in the moment. So um, as Janet said, uh, my name is Josh Sandquist. I am here talking about pharmacology. Um, I grew up in Western Iowa. I didn't have any family uh, that had gone to college, and so, but I was doing well in school, and it's getting to the point where you just automatically go to college. So at some point, I had to decide what am I going to do in college. And uh, my concept of what you did in college at the time was you went there to learn a trade. So I started thinking about what trades might I be interested in. I didn't really know, um, but the pharmacist in our small town went to my church. I uh, seemed like a nice guy. He did a lot of volunteer work at the uh, nursing home in our town. And I just, it just, pharmacy seemed like an interesting career to me. So I mentioned to someone, I think I like pharmacy. They said, well, Drake has a good pharmacy school. 
So I'm like, okay. So I applied to Drake, I got in, that was it, done. I didn't, I went, tell students now they're horrified that I only applied to one college. <laughs> they applied to like 20, right? So I go to Drake, um, of course you don't start learning pharmacy right away. Uh, I started learning about biology, chemistry, um, physiology, the study of how the body functions. These things are just fascinating. Now, topics I didn't really get into in high school. And so I decided that I wasn't really so much interested in uh, being a pharmacist working in a Walgreens or something, but I was much more interested in the science of how uh, drugs work. So I sort of changed modes a little bit. I left the professional track into a more, just a bachelor's track, and then I went to graduate school. Again, I had to make choices then, but I knew I had some background in pharmacy then, so I looked for pharmacology programs. Uh, applied to a few, Duke is the one that really uh, grabbed me, so I went to Duke University in North Carolina. There I learned about pharmacology, but I started doing research that shifted a little bit more towards Again, a little more towards the basic, just how does the body work, how does the cell work. So now, in my research, I don't really study pharmacology. I study how the cells in your body multiply and divide. Uh, but I still love all my training in pharmacology. I love it as a field. And I developed a new course here uh, at Grinnell, a pharmacology course that didn't exist before. And I love it, as Janet said, I like it because um, it's interdisciplinary. We talk about biology, we talk about chemistry, we talk about physics, we talk about all kinds of stuff to understand how the body works and how drugs work. And I also get to relate then the science that I talk about to society because most people interact with drugs at some point in their life. So um, I really like uh, this class and I'm glad I'm able to come here today and talk with you about it. I've heard about the bucket course a lot, I really love the concept, and but I've never been able to to give one, so I'm really glad that it worked out this time. So, um, a little bit about the four weeks, if you're able to come all four lectures. The general idea is today I'm going to start with a little history. What is pharmacology? Why study it? Where did um, pharmacology in the United States, in the western part of the world, how did that come about? How did that come into being? Then on lecture two next week, we'll get a little bit more sciencey. I want to give you a little bit of the science and talk about these important principles about how does the drug work in the body, on the body, with the body. Pick a, pick a preposition. We're going to learn a little bit about how these drugs move around and do things. Lecture three, um, I'm still developing this a little bit, but I want to then step back and think a little bit more broadly about the pharmaceutical industry. How does a drug get developed? What are the costs? What are the timelines? What are some of the nefarious things that pharmaceutical companies get up to? That's in the news a lot. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then finally, lecture four, I had a great opportunity last semester. I taught uh, a global learning course. So these are new things at Grinnell where there's course embedded travel. And there's a theme the courses have to follow. The theme I chose was the sort of medicine around the world, global medicine. Because while we have our particular medical system in the United States, there's a lot of other countries that do it very differently. And so we wanted to think about, um, about those things. And so in this class, I got the opportunity to travel with students to Japan and learn about their traditional medical system. And also we went to England and learned about some of the history of herbalism. So I'm not sure which of those we'll talk, we'll talk about something about that, something that's not related to the, the pills that we're going to focus on most of the, uh, the rest of the time. So that's the plan for the whole uh, course. For today, we're gonna, we've already covered my background a little bit, so we're doing that. Uh, now we're gonna move on to this question, what is pharmacology exactly? Some of you probably have a general sense that it deals with drugs, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Why study it? Why is it an important field? And then we'll get into the history, so uh, we don't have time to, to do it in detail, so this will be a brief history of where pharmacology came from. Can everyone still hear me okay? So what is pharmacology? As I said, I went to Duke uh, University. I was in a pharmacology and a cancer biology program. And I remember one day, I must have been there about three years, I was walking across campus to go get lunch, and I ran into a woman um, who was an alum. She was back looking, checking things out. We started chatting, and she asked me what I studied, and I, I said pharmacology. Oh, great, interesting. And we started chatting, and then she started asking all these questions about trees and 
agricultural landscapes. And I realized that she thought I said farm ecology, not pharmacology. So that's the first thing we have to clear up. It's not farm ecology, it's pharmacology. So farm, or pharma, that prefix here. Oops, wrong button. So it's prefix pharma, if Wikipedia or the Wiktionaries would be believed, the root of that goes way back to the ancient Greeks, pharmakia, um, which is, has to do with medicine, and that derived from this word pharmakon, which was their word for drug, but also poison, but also spell. So they kind of wrapped all those in together, drugs and magic, which makes a little sense, I think. So that's the general uh, prefix that you'll see in a lot of words today. A standard, a standard textbook definition you might see of pharmacology uh, would read something like this. The study of the biochemical and physiological effects of drugs on the body. So if we break that down, biochemical, um, in your body, the biology, there's a lot of chemistry that goes on in your cells. So there's a lot of chemical reactions that occur to drive the work that, your, that the cells in your body do. So that's biochemical. Physiological is the study of how an organism functions. So a living thing, like a human body. How do the systems work? How does the cardiovascular system work? So if we know, think about those terms and read this definition again, this definition of pharmacology says it's the study of how drugs interact with the chemical reactions that are already going on in your body and how affecting those chemical interactions will affect the functions of your body. So that's sort of a standard definition. I'm going to add that, complicate that a little bit. This is a definition that I, I would more think about. So it, it would be an interdisciplinary field of study so that multi-pronged approach to studying, concerned with understanding the various factors governing drug interactions with biological systems, as well as the effect of the drugs in those systems. So what I've added here is this idea of factors that govern how the drug interacts with the biological system. The one above is mostly concerned with the effects of the drugs. But what we're, we're going to learn about this course is Drugs do a lot to your body, but your body does a lot to the drugs as well. Uh, drugs have to move around, the body breaks down the drugs, has to get rid of it. So I like, uh, this is a little bit broader view of pharmacology. Some people might call this pharmaceutical sciences, it's a broader, maybe pharmacology is a sub-discipline of pharmaceutical sciences. The words are kind of used interchangeably in different places, so I don't want to get hung up on, on the terms. But what I, the idea I do want you to think about is um, pharmacology is a little bit broader than just what do drugs do to your body, what diseases do they fix. There's a lot of different ways of thinking and studying how drugs work. So some of these other ways of thinking about drugs, just a few terms here that aren't really going to be relevant to the rest of the talk, so you, well, maybe somewhat. So these are just some background knowledge. We don't feel like you have to memorize these. Uh, pharmacodynamics, so there's that prefix again. This is, so people who focus on pharmacodynamics are thinking about how the drugs interact with their direct targets. So when you take a drug, there's some specific thing in the body, a specific protein, usually, that the drug has to find and bind in order to produce its effect. So pharmacodynamics is the study of how does it bind to that, and what's its mechanism? How does it work? Okay. That's one aspect of this. Pharmacokinetics, again now drug kinetics. Kinetics is a term that basically sort of relates to time, to helping things in motion, movement. So these are factors controlling the concentration of drugs at different sites in the body at different times. So I want to unpack this a little bit. I'm going to use some graphs here. So imagine this is a graph where on this axis here we have time. So time zero would be the time, let's say you take a pill, and this would be 10 hours later, 20 hours, 30 hours later. 
On this axis here, we're going to measure the concentration of the drug. So the bracket is a shorthand for meaning concentration. So the amount, of, what we're looking at here is the amount of drug in your body. Usually it's measured, we'll take a little sample of your blood or something and measure how much drug is in there. So the numbers really are sort of meaningless here. Um, whatever the units are, just the amount of drug in your blood. So if I were to ask you this, what might the amount of drug in your body look like? I bet if you thought about hard enough, you could come up with something like this curve, maybe not the exact curve. But if you think of when you start at time zero, when you take the drug, there's no drug in your body, but then the amount of drug in the blood goes up really quickly. Then at some point, your body's gonna start breaking that down and removing the drug. So then the drug, the amount of drug in your blood will go down. So the effect of a pill doesn't last forever, right? You take one, the amount goes up, Eventually, it'll be broken down and it'll go down. So this is uh, pharmacokinetics, a study of the timing of all this. Why is this important? Let's say you need a concentration of the drug in your body that's 16 in order to produce an effect. Well, now we know this, this amount isn't going to do anything, right? So we'll need to take a pill that has more in it or something. We need to find a way to get more drug inside the body. If you needed an amount of eight, say eight milligrams per liter or whatever, some unit in the blood that uh, produces an effect, now we can see, oh, after you take the drug, there's not going to be an effect. At about, let's say, maybe it looks like maybe two hours, now we've got enough drug in the blood that it'll start to do what we want it to do. And it'll continue to go up and then go down. And then about, looks like maybe eight hours here, the drug is going to stop working. So this is what pharmacokinetics is. How long is it? How long does it take the drug to get in? How long will it be effective? And then when, when is it going to stop working? So this is important because if it's something you have to take a lot, like a, a blood pressure medication you just have to take regularly, we want to keep it above this line, right? So we need to know when do we take the second pill? So we know as this pill goes up, this one, oops, it's going to stop being effective about right here, so we need to know we need to take the little next one just a little bit before that, so the second pill goes up. So we're always keeping some amount of drug in the body above the amount that we want. <coughs> this is pharmacokinetics. I introduced this now. It's a little science, -y, but we're going to we're going to come back to this idea to use it to explain a few things a little bit later. Any questions about any of that? Okay, hey, let me know if you have questions. So we've talked about how drugs work, how the timing of how drugs move around, how much gets in, how much gets out. Another really important field is medicinal chemistry. So drugs are chemicals. Chemists then like to make modifications to those chemicals to improve things like the pharmacodynamics and the kinetics. So we want to make it act better with its target. Let's change this feature of the drug. Uh, maybe it gets in too slow. You take the pill and it takes six hours to take an effect. Let's see if we can change the chemistry of that molecule to make it act a little bit faster. So this is what medicinal chemists do. They just play around changing the drug, see if they can make it work better. Another important thing is pharmaceutics. So how do we package it? Do we want it in a pill? Do you take it as a drink? What other things need to be in the pill to make it work better? Pharmacogenomics. Uh, this is sort of a more of a new area. How do the different genetics of different people affect how a certain drug is going to work? <coughs> toxicology. That's the last term I'm going to introduce right now. Harmful effects of drugs. How are they toxic? Can we mitigate, reduce that toxicity? So these are just some, not all, but these are some of the important aspects. In every single drug that gets made, there's someone who sort of specializes in studying all these aspects of the drug in order to make it work appropriately. <coughs> so the ultimate goal, then, you might say, is to provide clinicians, so like your doctor, provide them with agents and with the information they need to treat pathophysiological conditions, so patho sort of just means disease, but to treat an illness 
in an individualized way. I introduce this term agent. It's an agent versus a drug. Why did I say agent? Well, a lot of farm drug, usually we're thinking of a, a, a purified chemical that's put in a pill form. There's a lot of things we take that aren't, don't really fit that definition. Uh, vaccines, uh, we're using a lot of antibodies these days to treat um, cancers. Those are protein-based. Um, there's genetic therapies people are using now. So all of these things are sort of studied in the same way by pharmacologists, but they're not a purified chemical on a pill. But we're going to focus on the pills sort of stuff. That's the most common. That's the easiest way to think about it. So here, for example, um, is a chemical. This is aspirin. So there's a, this is a small molecule, chemical nature, which we understand. Pack that into a pill. That's what most people think of when they think of the term drug. There's another uh, sort of a famous drug that's used now um, to treat cancer. That's basically just ground up shark cartilage. So that's just another example of treatment. Because cartilage prevents um, blood vessels from growing. There's no blood vessels in there. And a lot of cancers, we want to reduce the amount of blood so it doesn't feed the cancer. So it's just shark cartilage that's ground up. And someone quaffs a dish, really fishy tasting. But that's, that's an agent that people use, right? It's not a small molecule. It's not a dr drug, the way we think of it. But it's still a pharmaceutical agent. that we can study and apply these same principles to. All right, this is a time where I usually try to complicate things for students. What do we call vitamins drugs then? Vitamins are small molecules. Here's a bunch of different structures of different molecules. Can anyone, I'm not asking this is a rhetorical question, but just looking at them, would you be confident saying one of those is a drug and one of those is a vitamin? Probably not. We have calcociferol, vitamin D3, ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Vitamin C doesn't look that different from the aspirin that I just showed you. Atorvastatin is a Lipitor, is Lipitor. Again, probably doesn't look that different from vitamin D. So these are all just small chemical molecules that we use. But people think very differently when you say this is a vitamin versus this is a drug. Vitamins, I think this term drug is sort of loaded. Um, and the term vitamin, a lot of times people will think drug is you know, a chemical that's manufactured, it's synthetic, or a vitamin is natural. And the implication then is uh, that vitamins are safe. But what are vitamins? Vitamins are just chemicals that your body needs, that your body can't produce by itself. So you have, to, you have to eat it, you have to consume it. Vitamin C is sort of a weird one. Let's go back to vitamin C. Because most mammals, dogs, cats, all kinds of other stuff, they can make their own vitamin C, so they don't need to get it from their diet. But humans, for some reason, they have the same enzyme that dogs have, but somehow it got mutated, so it's turned off. So we can't make our own vitamin C. So it used to be something that just our bodies made. We wouldn't have to eat oranges and limes and those things. But because of a mutation somehow over time, now vitamin C is a vitamin. We have to consume it from our diet. Otherwise, you get scurvy. So let's go back to this idea of vitamins are safe because they're natural, right? Well, we quote Paracelsus, a famous thinker in the you wouldn't call him a pharmacologist because pharmacy didn't exist back then as a, as a field. But he thought about these things, and he said the quote, the dose makes the poison. So anything you consume could be poisonous if you take the wrong amount. Even water, you take too much water, it could be toxic. So, but how do we quantify toxicity, how toxic is something? Well, there's this concept that we use in pharmacology because we want to study these things. The therapeutic index, or get a TI, is the concentration that will be toxic in your body divided by the concentration that you need for it to be effective, to do what you want it to do. 
So let's go back to this plot here that we looked at. This is our drug. We take it times zero. The concentration goes up. It goes down. And we're going to say that you need this amount. You need eight in order for it to be effective. If it's below eight. It's not going to work. It's not going to do anything. Yes? Does it also depend on the size of the body of the person taking the drug? That's a good question. She asked, uh, does the amount that it takes to be effective depend on the size of the body? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, kids versus adults have to be treated very differently. Also different body compositions. If someone's more muscular or has a little bit more adipose tissue, they use a lot of factors. So if, um, if something's a really safe drug, usually there's enough wiggle room that you don't have to change too much. But some drugs are less safe, and this concept we're going to talk about in a second will explain that. Then you have to be a lot more careful. That's an excellent question. So, back to our graph here, let's say you need eight for it to be effective in the blood. And let's, let's say we know that if it gets to 16, it'll be toxic. This gives us the information we need to do our, our calculation here. So you take the concentration of toxic, 16, divided by eight, that gives us two. So this number is two, meaning you need twice as much to be toxic as to be effective. So if we accidentally took two pills instead of one pill one morning, we might be in the danger zone, right? So what you want is the concentration to be toxic to be way up here, really high, right? So you need to take 10 or 20 pills on accident in order for it to be toxic. We can't really control that, but we do our best. Some drugs, sort of weirdly, not excitingly, have an inverted relationship. So some drugs, the amount that is toxic is less than the amount you can actually to do what you want it to do. An example of this is lithium used to treat bipolar disease. It's really the best drug we have to treat the symptoms, but it, uh, the amount that you take to be effective is above the amount that you see toxicity. So people, there's not a lot about lithium that you can change itself. So the way people are trying to fix this is, is there another drug we can get with lithium It'll block the bad effects so we can take enough to get to where it'll produce the good effects. <coughs> so uh, back to our question of vitamin D. Vitamin D has a therapeutic index of 2.5, meaning if you take 2.5 times too much, two, two and a half pills instead of one, you might start to be toxic. That's actually a pretty small window. We like things to be well above two. So vitamin D is not really that safe. The other thing about vitamin D, these sort of rings that you see here, this means that vitamin D is fat soluble. I won't go into all the details of that now, but what it means is it goes in fast, but it takes a long time for your body to get rid of it. So if someone forgot they took their vitamin D in the morning and they take it again in the afternoon, it wasn't up and gone, it's still in there, now that second dose is going to be added to it. So it's really easy for people to take too much vitamin D. And it's not really regulated. You don't get a prescription for it. You can just go buy bottles of it off the shelf right now. The different strengths. And it says on the back how much you should take, but not everyone reads those things carefully or they might forget. And so the point I just wanted to make here is this is a vitamin just because it has, says the word vitamin. A lot of people I think are um, tricked into thinking it's maybe safer than it is. Um, it's not, Question. it won't, oh, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Question was, what happens to you if you take too much vitamin D? Um, it's not something that's deadly at, at a low level. I forget what the, the most likely toxic effect is. I think there's things like uh, lethargy, getting a little bit sleepier and things first. There's probably multiple effects that you'll feel depending on how much you take. I'm not exactly... It's a good question. I'll try to remember looking that up, and I'll tell you next week what the dangers of vitamin D overdose are. Other question? Yes? What about the effects of sunshine and vitamin D? Oh, good. The question was, what about the effects of sunshine and vitamin D? Vitamin D is a curious um, 
vitamin in that you t the things you eat that have vitamin D in it don't have the form that's active. So we call it vitamin D1, D2, D3. So you'll eat something and then the sun converts that D1, let's say, into D2 or to D3, and that's the form that your body needs. So the amount of sun exposure will change the amount of vitamin D you have. And so people who live in Alaska who have much less sunlight are recommended to take more vitamin D during the winter and less during the summer. So these are all things that we have to sort of keep track of, which again, you know, sort of goes back to the point of it's, it's a little bit tricky to keep track of all this, right? And vitamins aren't quite as safe as some people might always think they are. All right, great question. Thank you. All right. Um, along here. So um, these vitamins, dietary supplements, these are things like vitamins, herbals, other natural products. They are substances that are promoted for health usually, but they're just not called drugs. <coughs> because they're not called drugs, they're not regulated by the Federal the Food and Drug Administration in the same way. So they can't make claims on the bottle about them, medical claims. But they still find ways to sneak it in in magazines or the internet. So people know what, what you're supposed to take it for, even though they can't claim it's a medicine. And because it bypasses the FDA, the FDA doesn't really have any oversight. So normally, the F, if you want to make a new drug, you have to test it, you have to prove to the FDA that it's safe and it's effective. For uh, dietary supplements, the burden of proof is on the FDA. They, no one has to prove anything really to the FDA ahead of time. It just goes on the market, and the FDA is responsible for keeping track of, oh, a lot of people are taking this and getting sick. So the burden of proof is on them to prove that it's not safe and remove it. There's not really any teeth to remove stuff that's not dangerous but ineffective. So something's marketed for, to make you smarter, it doesn't, it's not toxic, it's not hurting you, but it doesn't do that. The FDA can't really remove it because it's a supplement. The FDA just can't control these things in the same way as they can't control drugs. So another example I'll give here, um, ginseng. People have heard of ginseng? Something that's usually promoted to increase your mental acuity, things like that. Um, this is derived from se several species of plants from the genus pa Panix. The active ingredient in the plant is a molecule called ginsenoids. So here's an example of what they look like. It's a big ugly monster there. It's recommended that when you take some ginseng, that'll have 4 to 10% of these ginsenoids. The trouble here is that there are over 30 types of ginsenoids. There's 30 variations on this thing, this chemical. Um, other plants that aren't from this same family of plants, ain't, that aren't from Panix, are sometimes marketed as ginseng. So there's something that's called Siberian ginseng, but it doesn't actually even have any of these ginsenoids. It has another molecule called these eleutherosides. But it's marketed as ginseng in the same way. And the FDA can't, doesn't really control this. This is dangerous because ginseng has blood thinning activity. So if someone is taking, has anyone heard of warfarin? Yeah. Warfarin is a very common <coughs> blood thinner for people with high blood pressure, but also has a famously small therapeutic index. It's dangerous. Usually when you start taking it, the doctors give you a very small amount, see how things are going, give you a little bit more, see how things are going. They kind of creep it up to just what you personally can handle, because it's really easy to take too much. Well, if you're just on that threshold and then someone takes ginseng, which then has the same effect, then it can become dangerous. And again, ginseng, it's natural. You don't think to tell your doctor that you're trying it. So these can create these sort of problems. So these are examples of why we, hopefully while you're in this course, hopefully some of the things you'll learn. You know, why study pharmacology? Well, maybe students might want to be a doctor or a pharmacist. But just for personal reasons, so you can be an educated consumer to know how to take your, your pills properly. Um, civic reasons as well. There's a lot of the news about pharmaceutical industry, how drugs should be regulated, how we should be able to buy them. So hopefully you'll be a more informed citizen and voter after some of what you learn in this class. 
Just a quick example, this is kind of a fun example I like to share. There's this commercial that aired in the 80s that relates to this. Hopefully this works. Make it bigger here. So this is something that um, in this same sentiment is rearing its ugly head now when we talk about anti-vaccine work. It's just this idea that we know what we want, we know what's safe, why does the government have to stick its nose in and tell us how to do things, right? Here's another example um, that I'd like to share again of why it's important to know your father's policy. <laughs> so here's, uh, uh, this is a quote that I'm reading from the book Powerful Medicines. It's one that I've I suggested if you are interested in reading more on this topic, I think the library has a copy of this. Uh, this is a really excellent uh, look at just how drugs, the drug industry works, how, how the effects on medicine or medical uh, interventions. So the quote is, in a former British colony, most healers believed that the conventional wisdom that a distillation of fluids extracted from the urine of horses if dried to a powder and fed to an aging woman, could act as a general tonic, preserve youth, and ward off a variety of diseases. The preparation became enormously popular throughout the culture and was used widely by older women in all strata of society. Many years later, modern scientific studies revealed that the long-term ingestion of the horse urine extract was useless for most of the intended purposes and that it caused tumors, blood clots, heart disease, and perhaps brain damage. Mm -hmm. Yes? That's a good one. That's, you've, you've guessed the joke here. When did this happen? This was the United States. This is today. This, relate, this is the seven, from the 70s. It relates to the use of estrogen. Estrogen is a hormone replacement therapy. So it turns out that the best source of estrogen there's estrogen in um, horse urine, and you can dry that and purify it. And so um, there was this natural idea that made a lot of sense. Women going through menopause, they have less estrogen in their body. So let's just give them more estrogen to replace that and um, ameliorate some of the effects of uh, menopause, you know, hot flashes. And that's actually what it was studied for originally, use of hormone replacement to treat hot flashes. Um, but the problem is the way it was studied. So it was studied, there's some studies that were done that showed, hey, this estrogen does seem to help women with hot flashes. So they put that on the market. Doctors were able to prescribe that. Now, all of a sudden, they started thinking, well, you know, menopausal women have more heart disease. Let's um, give them estrogen for that, too. Now, it was never studied, to shown that it'd be effective there. But this is what's called off-label uses. Once a drug is shown to be safe, and then generally safe and effective for a certain thing, it goes in the market, doctors can prescribe it for whatever they want. 
The pharmaceutical companies can advertise it for those other uses, but doctors can use it however they want. So the doctors started saying, oh, let's use it for um, heart disease as well. And there were some studies that sort of backed this up. They found some women who were already taking estrogen and some women who weren't. And they said, look, these women who are taking estrogen have fewer incidents of heart attacks. The problem with that was it wasn't a um, um, study where people were randomly assigned. So they just found women who were already taking estrogen. Who are these women? These are women who probably are wealthier, have access to a doctor, they're very proactive about their health. They're probably doing a lot of things that are helping their health. And they found other people who weren't taking it. And of course, those women who were really proactive about their health had better um, outcomes. So the study wasn't really um, done in a way to prove that estrogen isn't effective. But people wanted to believe that. And then it turns out when they actually did the studies in the right way, they found these other things that it could cause heart disease actually to cancer. So this is another important reason to, to learn about pharmacology. We'll take a break there, um, and we'll come back and we'll do a little bit more of the history. Thank you, Josh. I just want to make one quick announcement before you head out. So we're back, and now we're transitioning into the history phase. Hopefully I didn't put in too much history, because I know we got to get out of here on time. But I think this is sort of fascinating to think about where, where this came from. Um, so I'm going to read to you a little bit here in a second. But the study of drugs really goes back our brief history is in certain antiquity. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but the basic idea, there are records from um, way long ago. I can't remember the date when the Ebers papyrus was thought to have been written. But it showed that people recognized the beneficial and toxic effects of plants and animals that they were eating. They knew when I ate this, this other thing usually happened to me. Right? So people understood that things that they ingested had an impact on their body. And ever since then, it's just been refining that, trying to study, understand that more specifically. So there's this excerpt I like to read. It's from the Trial and Death of Socrates, which is based on writings of Plato, Socrates' student. And Socrates was sentenced to death, and so uh, he was put to death by poison. And he, were, so this is a scene from this where they were giving him the poison that he was going to take to end his life. And it's kind of a lot of words, I'm not going to put up there, I'm just going to read it. So the person says, you have only to drink this, he replied, and to walk about until your legs feel heavy, and then lie down, and it will act of itself. But he walked about until he said that his legs were getting heavy, and then he lay down on his back as he was told. And the man who gave the poison began to examine his feet and legs from time to time. Then he pressed his foot hard and asked if there was any feeling in it. Socrates said, no. And then his legs, and so higher and higher, and showed us that he was cold and stiff. And Socrates felt himself and said that when it came to his heart, he should be gone. He was already growing cold and about to groin, and when he uncovered his face, which had been covered, and spoke for the last time, Crito, he said, I owe a cock to Aesleptus. Do not forget to pay it. It shall be done, replied Krita. So I read this scene because I think it's interesting how they knew exactly what to look for when the, when the poison was working, how it was going to work. This was actually a, a tea made from hemlock, which is uh, poison, contains a toxin similar to nicotine, so it acts on your nerves, uh, basically just stops. I think that what probably kills you is it stops you from being able to breathe. And so uh, they had a very careful understanding of the reproducible effects of this tea. They knew exactly what would happen in what order. So this is what I meant by people knew the stuff they ingested would have an effect, but they didn't know what nicotine was, how it worked, anything like that, right? So in the early AD, attempts were made um, to make the practice of medicine a little bit more rational and scientific. A lot of beforehand, there was this mystical thinking a lot of, um, they tried to put the understanding of these drugs into their broader worldview, maybe about magic or gods or things, because they didn't really have any other way to understand it. But people began to realize that there's something a little more physical here. Let's remove the mysticism and theory and try to actually devise experiments to figure out how this is working. You know, a lot of the random thought, like 
bloodletting, which actually has some concept behind it. It's still used in some ways, but not the way originally people tried. Or even things like applying a salve to a weapon. So if you're wounded by a weapon, apply the salve not to your wound, but to the weapon that wounded you, because they had <laughs> magical thoughts about how that might work, that action at a distance, right? So we had, they had to prove, and this seems, I know it seems silly from our point of view. There was a worldview they were operating in then, and they didn't understand. Um, but this is where it came from. So then we move up, we're going to fast forward to the 1600s, and following the physical sciences, physics uh, started to get a lot more rigorous in study. And people start to apply, study medicine in the same sort of methods. Um, they start to do experiments and observation, which is hard because experimenting on people, there's some moral um, questions there. And then in the late 1700s, there's a, a fellow by the name of William Withering who was studying foxglove. Uh, the purified chemical that's active in foxglove is digitalis or di digoxin. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. It's commonly used for was, it's a little bit dangerous, used for heart medication for a long time. Um, I'm going to read you again a little excerpt from um, Withering's writings on his study of the foxglove plant. So he says, My worthy predecessor in this place, the very human and ingenious Dr. Small, had made it a practice to give his advice to the poor during one hour in the day. This practice, which I continued until we had a hospital open for the reception of the sick poor, gave me an opportunity of putting my ideas into execution in a variety of cases. So it's a study on the poor, but not, not the wealthy, I guess. For the number of poor who thus applied for advice amounted to between two and 3,000 annually. I soon found the foxglove to be a very powerful diuretic. But then, and for a considerable time afterward, I gave it in doses very much too large, and urged its continuance too long, for misled by the reasoning from the effects of the squill, another plant that had similar diuretic effects, which generally acts best on the kidneys when it excites nausea. I wish to produce the same effect by the foxglove. I was now determined to pursue my former ideas more vigorously than before, this is a little bit later in the piece. I was too well aware of the uncertainty which must attend the exhi exhibition of a root from a biennial plant, and therefore I continued to use the leaves. These I found the very much as to dose a different season of the year, but I expected, if gathered always in one condition of the plant, when it was in a flowering state and carefully dried, that the dose might be ascertained as exactly as that of any other medicine. Nor have I been disappointed in this expectation. So withering was identifying the specific actions, and he realized it's coming from a plant, a change in the year, it's a biennial plant, so the root's different from one year from the next. He tried to find a way to reproducibly harvest the leaves, knowing that there's something in the leaves, in the plant that's doing it, didn't know exactly what it is, but he wanted to find a way so he knows when you give this much to this person, you give the same amount to another person, you get pretty much the same effect. This is really one of the first um, this is a great example of how these studies began to evolve. Foxglove was really, um, it's not the best word, but a really strong medication, a strong chemical, had a very strong effect. So it was kind of dangerous, it was easy to take too much. And so generally people just avoided those plants. They used plants that produced an effect that were much safer and less strong. But it turns out that a lot of things that are really poisonous are actually really good chemicals, good drugs, they have good effects, we just have to know how to tame them. And so this was, this was Withering's first attempt at doing that. Claude Bernard is a really famous physiologist, not again someone who's really concerned with pharmacology. Um, but what he did is he, he was studying how the body works. He just wanted to know how the body works. And he saw that toxic substances, again, so these things like foxglove, he thought them as, quote, as kinds of physiological instruments, more sensitive than our mechanical means, and well suited to act, so to say, in dissecting one by one the properties of the anatomical elements of the living organism. So for example, oh, he studied how carbon dioxide and hemoglobin's role in oxygen transport, sorry, I forgot that was in there, oh, it's kind of apropos given the the recent Nobel Prize in oxygen uptake. He used uh, Karari, a toxic chemical that was used in poison arrow darts, 
to study how nerves work. So Karari works at the, the place where the nerves come and meet your muscle and tell the muscle to contract. So Karari works there and he found this is a toxin and he toned it down and figured out how to use it as a tool to understand how the body works, how nerves work. In doing so, he understands a little bit about how drugs work, but also the targets that drugs, the things that drugs are targeting. So we have this understanding of using drugs more carefully, with William Withering. We have people like Claude Bernard who are understanding how the body works in a more careful way. And we start to put those two things together, carefully examining drugs on effects of the body that we can measure very carefully. I skip a and the last idea I'm going to put forward here uh, regarding this sort of deep history of pharmacology. Um, in the 1800s, Paul Ehrlich developed this idea of drug receptors. Has anyone seen this movie, Dr. Ehrlich's Magic Bullet? came out in, I think, 1940. It was nominated for a, um, an Oscar, I think, for original screenplay. It lost out to, what did it lose out to? I had this written down here. Mr. McGiddy or something like that. <laughs> um, Edward G. Robinson started in here. This is a really, if you see it, it's a really great movie actually. A little bit um, not exactly historically accurate, but I think close enough to kind of just switch things around. Um, but what Paul Ehrlich, he was a chemist, and he was staining cells with dyes, just like dyes, you'd use a dye your clothing. And he observed that certain dyes stuck to some bacteria better than others, and actually even different parts of the bacteria. So we started to realize that this was happening in a reproducible way. There must be something physical where this dye interacts with something very specific inside the cell to make it always go to that place in the bacteria. So he got this idea that chemicals physically interact with things in the body in a very reproducible way. So he used that to help um, stain cells and treat um, malaria. So he had one of the first ways to identify the malaria parasite. Um, he moved on and started studying antibodies and he won a Nobel Prize for his work in understanding how the immune system works. Um, he also developed what he called chemotherapy, which isn't exactly how we think of it today, but chemo prefix meaning chemical. So this idea that, so once he kind of, they kind of um, surpassed their ability to use the immune system. The immune system works really well on infectious, infectious agents like bacteria and things like that, but the immune system doesn't really work to cure things like high blood pressure, right? So he started developing, trying to identify chemicals, he's a chemist in training, manipulating chemicals that he could use to treat other conditions. And he actually developed an arsenic-based compound that was used to treat syphilis. It was the most effective treatment until it was discovered that antibiotics work on syphilis. He contracted tuberculosis in his studies because he was trying to get tuberculosis, the samples of that. Um, so he was a really influential figure for the idea that drugs act by specifically binding something in the body. That was the main idea that he put forth. That was really influential. Uh, so in the 19, uh, 19th and 20th century, these advances in chemistry, these advances in physiology, people started to see things that medicines were much more successful than they used to be. People started to develop a lot of confidence. People were making drugs that actually worked in ways that you could see very clearly. Of course, someone's going to come in and try to take advantage of that confidence. So these patent medicines, snake oil salesmen, took advantage of the confidence in chemicals, started making junk and giving it to people, calling it medicine. So this ushered in an era of regulation. <clears throat> so in 1906, uh, the first, the FDA was formed in the Pure Food and Drug Act. Uh, this was mostly concerned just though with like food purity and moving things across state lines. It didn't really have, it wasn't really effective in uh, getting up with the patent medicine pushers. <laughs> then, but that was the, that was the law of the land for a while. Um, people sort of resistant, you know, to government intrusion on things. And then, uh, has anyone heard of the Massengill Massacre? You know, elixir sulfanilamide. This was a drug. Um, sulfanilamide was made to treat, oh, she always forget what it is. Um, 
streptococcal infections in children. Yes. So it was made by the company Massengill. It was called the Massengill murder or um, massacre because the solvent, the liquid that they used to dissolve the drug, was diethylene glycol, which is essentially antifreeze. <laughs> so they knew that it worked. He was a chemist. They knew that it worked really well to dissolve the drug. They had no understanding of its biological properties. They started giving it to kids and killed a bunch of kids. So now we have this, because before, the, food, the Pure Food and Drug Act didn't require people to prove that the things that you were eating were safe. It just had to do with purity. Is this meat clean? Is this whatever? So now, after the Massengill Massacre, they changed the, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938, required um, that you submit something to the FDA saying that the thing you want to give is safe. You still didn't have to prove it worked as you intended it to work. You just had to prove that it was safe. And the application came into the FDA, the FDA might say, okay, but there was a time limit. If you didn't hear a response in like three months or something, I can't remember what it was, it was just assumed that you could go ahead and start selling it. So it's a little bit better, they were working on safety, but you didn't have to prove that it worked yet. <laughs> and then there was thalidomide in the 1960s. So thalidomide, you know, I'm sure I hear a lot of <laughs> people have heard of thalidomide, right? Um, this was something that was used in the UK, but not used in the United States, because the chair, the head of the FDA at that time thought there wasn't enough evidence of its safety. Particularly because it was being used primarily in pregnant women uh, to treat um, hysteria, this is what they called it, right? So it was um, used, so it was used to uh, treat, uh, well, hysteria and morning sickness, actually, yeah. So it's decided to have a lot of different effects. The morning sickness was the main reason, I guess, it was given. And um, the times, again, does not test it for safety, especially what effects it might have on the fetus. And so everyone in the United States says, why can't we have thalidomide? It's working so well in the UK. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of babies are being born with birth defects. And now the head of the FDA looks like a hero. And people all of a sudden have newfound confidence in the ability of the government to actually protect us. Before, they thought, the government can't force us to prove efficacy. That's just so much work to prove that our drug works, right? <laughs> Let's just make sure it's not going to kill anyone and start selling it. So the Kiefer-Harris Amendment wasn't really looking like it was going to pass. It was being worked on, and the thalidomide incident came through, and now all of a sudden it looks like the FDA knows what it's doing. And so that allowed the kiefer Harris Amendment of 1962, which required then that people prove that drugs are safe and efficacious. And then it's been filled with over time, but this is largely the format that we follow now, the Food and Drug Administration. So why is it so difficult? Why do people balk at that? Why is it so difficult to prove that a drug actually works as intended? Well, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, Anyone heard of the placebo effect? Yeah. So depending on the study you read, 30% of people who take a sugar pill might be cured for whatever they're, whatever they're feeling. So just the act of taking something that people think is going to cure them sometimes cures them. So if that's the baseline, sometimes it's hard to prove that your drug is actually working better than that, right? Um, other things, the same disease may have a different causes. So if you think of pneumonia, it could be bacterial or viral. Someone comes in, says, I have pneumonia. Well, let's put you in our study for our new pneumonia drug. It may work great on the people who have bacterial pneumonia, but not the people who have viral pneumonia. So again, it's hard to prove it doesn't really work if you don't know what you're trying to cure, right? So this is where we need more information, understanding how the disease works and how the drug works. And then genetic differences. We have a lot of genetic differences. Maybe a drug will work on one group but not another. So it, it does take a lot of work to prove that a drug actually has an effect. It's easy to prove it's toxic. Give it to someone, they have bad effects, it must be toxic. But to prove that it's working and it's actually the drug that's producing the effect, that, that can take some effort. So this is where our clinical trials come in. Probably one of the most important, I think, important inventions related to medicine that uh, exists. So the clinical trial, and we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the estrogen thing, right? There were studies on estrogen, but they weren't done in the right way that you could actually prove that they were effective. 
people were reading into them what they wanted to. So there's a little bit of history here on the clinical trials. The first one probably goes way back. There was a surgeon 19, or in the 1700s, James Lind. He was a surgeon on the Royal Navy. The people were getting scurvy. And he conducted his own little scurvy trial. He, he had 12 people on his boat. They all had scurvy. And so he kept them all in the same room on the boat. He broke them up. To these two, he gave something that someone thought cured scurvy. To these two, he gave seawater. To these two, he gave oranges and lime. And he had, but he kept make sure they had the exact same meals, otherwise they were staying in the same quarters. He kept everything as close to similar as possible, except the thing that he was giving them to treat the scurvy. And they found that the oranges and the lime cured the scurvy. So that was our, sort of our first documented case of sort of these carefully controlled clinical trials. Uh, it wasn't until I think the 1860s that I'm able to find that the sort of first documented use of a placebo in a drug study, people had recognized that this was happening and just take nothing, water, and it cures some people. But they actually started putting those into studies. And the Medical Research Council of UK did a few important things in the 40s. They had the first double-blind trial, which means that neither the patient nor the doctor knew what they were taking. So you could take either a placebo or the medicine. Problem was sometimes if um, the doctor knew you were taking the medicine and not the placebo, then, and they really want the drug to work, like, yeah, you actually look a little better. Because, you know, you're taking that drug. So they wanted it to be where no one knew what anyone was taking. They could make an assessment. Are you getting better or not? And then uncover it and say, okay, yeah, actually you're taking the drug or not. So the double-blind study and then the randomized trial relates back to the estrogen thing we talked about. When people come into the study, you have to randomly assign them to either the placebo group or the drug group. If you had people who self-select, like those women who were already taking estrogen, they might have some other factor that's really causing it, not the estrogen. They were already more health conscious, right? So people need to be just assigned ra randomly, no, no reason for assigning anyone one way or the other, have everyone blind so they don't know what they're taking, and then we, you make an unbiased assessment. So this is the evolution. It can't always work exactly this way, like if you were taking that shark cartilage that I talked about, it's really hard to produce that fishy flavor in the placebo. So some people don't know if they're taking something that tastes fishy or not, right? So sometimes these things can't be hidden, but we do the best we can when we can. So then we get to the 60s and 70s, uh, 20th century. Biochemistry was used to identify more drug targets. So biochemistry is a discipline that we can break down cells and purify parts of it. So remember I said the important um, advance that Ehrlich made was that he identified a chemical specifically bind to one specific type of protein. Well, our advances in the, the field of biochemistry allow us to purify proteins and decide, okay, does it bind to this protein? Does it bind to this protein? Uh, so we can identify the targets of drugs, or identify this is the protein that's <laughs> causing the problem in the disease. Now let's find a, a chemical that will bind to it. The 80s just advanced this even more. Um, the field of called molecular biology, where people started to use DNA. They could actually make proteins in a test tube rather than having to purify them from cells. This way really just sped up this, this process of identifying the targets that drugs might want to bind to. And in the last couple decades, Genome sequencing has really sped things up as well. How are genetic differences between people affecting their response to drugs? So that kind of gets us to where we are today in the study of pharmacology. Uh, just a quick review of some of these concepts, and there'll be should be a good time for questions. Pharmacology, we sort of we decided it was a study of relationships between drugs and the body. What is a drug? How's a drug act in the body? We're going to learn more next week about what happens to the drug inside the body. How does it get in? How does the body metabolize it? How does it move it? We talked about what are drugs. It sort of complicated the simple narrative of drugs are harsh synthetic chemicals and vitamins and other things are 
safe, natural things. <laughs> we went over some of the history of how people started to understand how the body works. Chemists got better, purified chemicals, developed research methods to test the effect of those chemicals on our understanding of the body parts. And it, slowly over time, we got to where we are today with clinical trials. So we go from stuff we ingest affects our body, we have an understanding of how the body works, chemistry, concepts of drug receptors, clinical trials prove that it's safe and effective. And that's where we are today. So I'll stop there, leave time for questions, and uh, hope you guys enjoy. Yes? Why are um, vitamins not considered a drug? They don't run down on four legs and grow out of the ground. They're an isolated substance. Why, how have they escaped being controlled by the FDA? It's a good question. So the question was, why are vitamins not regulated by the FDA like drugs? Why don't we consider them drugs? And the short answer probably is money. Uh, the, the supplement industry is huge. People make tons of money selling vitamins, selling drugs, or selling uh, natural herbs and things like that. And so lobbyists were able to keep those outside the reach of the um, Food and Drug Administration. And you have commercials like what Mel Gibson it's just vitamin C, it's just in oranges. And then people understand that and not a lot of the other concepts we talked about today. And so it's kind of a losing battle. But it's probably money mostly. Yes, sir? Are you doing any research of any kind? I am doing, the question is, am I doing research? What am I, I do research, but um, so right now I study the basics of how a cell will divide. But I use my training in pharmacology, I use a lot of drugs, kind of like Claude Bernard did, to interrogate how the body works. So I'll use chemicals, and maybe I'll want X to stop happening in the cell so I can see how that affects the process that I'm studying. So um, there are good ways and bad ways, or effective ways and ineffective ways of using these chemicals in research. So my tr I think my training in pharmacology makes me a better user of drugs as a research tool, but I don't, um, and the things I study could, um, so cell division is really important in um, a lot of diseases, but cancer is a major one. Cancer basically is a condition where cells just divide uncontrollably. You have more and more cells and a tumor grows. So I'm not really studying cancer, but if I understand how cells divide normally, and someone may be able to say, oh, this is what's going wrong in cancer, maybe then we can, we can treat the cancer this way. Uh, okay. uh, can you say some things about homeopathic medicine? So the question is about homeopathic medicine. What, uh, what can I say about that? Um, the general idea of homeopathic medicine, as I understand it, sometimes these definitions shift, is that you'll use a molecule diluted to vanishingly small amounts, such that then it somehow it, it's effective. Um, you know, I don't. I will just say, you know, based on my scientific training, it just seems hard to believe that that, that could work because it'll be diluted so many times that there cannot be a molecule even in the, the glass of water you're drinking, right? Or maybe there's just one, and just knowing. Again, the physical base action at a distance doesn't work. The, the drug needs to bind a physical thing in the cell. So it could be wrapped up partly in the uh, placebo effect. That's where the, um, um, when people see that it works, it might just be a placebo case. You know, there are people that swear that I went to this homeopathic doctor and did X and it, and it cured me, and I believe them. I can't explain it with, with what I know other than maybe the placebo effect. Let's see. Uh, what do you mean by this word bind, as in the drug binds to something? That's a good question. So um, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week. Um, question. Oh yeah, good. Question, what the question is, what do I mean by a drug binding something? That means physically connecting to and, 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 and touching it. And so sometimes they may be bound together to where then they'll never come apart again. Other times it's just more um, that they're kind of held together because they have 
forces that attract each other together. These would be chemical forces. Maybe you can think of it like gravity. The chemistry works to pull them together. But it usually works if they have complementary shapes. So there's this concept called the key lock theory. If you have a drug, a drug will bind this protein and not that protein because they have shapes that just are very complementary and they'll fit together just right. And other ones won't. So we'll look at that a little bit more next week. That, thank you, that's a good clarification. Yeah, I'll come back there next, yeah. This may be far afield, but does your field feel any sense of debt to Da Vinci? Does my, he did, that's not what, this is not his field, but... Uh, yeah, the question is, does, does pharmacology have any debt to Da Vinci? And I would just say yes, and that Da Vinci was very important in understanding anatomy, how the body works. And so all of this, Science is something that accumulates knowledge over time, right? Everything that came before is built upon. And so uh, Claude Bernard probably was really in debt to Da Vinci's understanding of the body. In particular, for a long time, it wasn't really cool for people to dissect bodies. And so uh, Da Vinci was a source of knowledge on that. And we had these magical understandings of how our body works on the inside, because people never really looked at it. When people like Da Vinci started looking at it, then we learned something. The hand back there, yes. Yes, uh, the FDA's definition of effectiveness, if I understand correctly, is that it works better than a placebo. But the FDA is not required to indicate above that how effective it is, and the FDA certainly doesn't can serve as, a con as the consumer reports of drugs. So that's one question. A related question is on the negative side, uh, drugs are recognized as having all sorts of negative side effects, but we don't, the FDA doesn't give you any idea, doesn't compel the drug maker to give you any idea of how likely these side effects are. And thus we have no idea, we can't compare either effectiveness of drugs or the likelihood of negative side effects. Good. Summarize that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Those are good questions. Um, need another hour and a half. No. Uh, the questions were about the FDA. So one, um, the idea is the FDA. When a FDA says a drug is effective, it's saying that it beats the placebo. So the placebo may work 20% of patients. The drug has to work more than that in order for it to be proven to be effective. But the FDA doesn't say, is it 25, is it 40%, you know, how likely are you to be cured by this? That's not really the FDA's concern. They're just saying, um, someone says this is going to treat headaches, and there's evidence that it treats headaches. Now the doctors have to decide, they're going to start using it, and say, oh, when I give it to this patient, I, I don't really see that it works like as often as I would like, or it's not quite as good as this other thing. So over time, um, the, industry, the people using it learn a little bit better about how it works and what cases. There is some reporting back to the FDA even after a drug is approved and released. They fall back and if it turns out that it's not effective. Um, but if it's not effective, doctors will stop prescribing it. So the drug companies do have an interest in developing things that work, otherwise people aren't going to buy it. The second question was sort of the inverse of that. Um, the drug the they may list side effects of the drug, but again, it's not stated exactly how likely those side effects are. And again, that's where the doctor and the pharmacist are going to intervene, um, because sometimes it, the side effects may be more or less likely in different groups, elderly versus young, or this group versus that group. And so again, it's always sort of this ongoing conversation about that the doctor will look at the study and say, you know, 5% of people in this study of 1,000 people reported headaches for what that's worth. So there's a 5% chance you'll have a headache. You know, and it's hard to know what to do with that information. You have to decide, well, a, a headache is better than um, massive bleeding or whatever my condition is. So the, but a, a headache may not be better than something else if we're taking you know, for something much more mild. So it's kind of a complicated conversation, but the FDA is just sort of minimally, um, is it dangerous? If it is dangerous, here's how dangerous it is, so your doctor can decide if that danger is okay relative to what we're trying to treat, and other things like that. Um, two more questions, two short questions, yes. This is just a comment, and it's about clinical trials. 
trials, and uh, my brother was part of the clinical trial for the uh, polio vaccine in the 50s. Wow. So we have someone in the audience whose brother was a, a part of the polio tr clinical trials in the 1950s. So yeah, we need people to participate in these trials to prove that they're safe, to prove that they're effective. There's a whole side thing I can't get into now. Who participates in, in these things can sometimes be problematic for a lot of reasons. Um, that's yeah. very, Maybe I'll get into that in the third lecture. We'll see. But one more question, yes. How about pro probiotics? Are they regulated at all, or how does that fit in with this? Probiotics, I don't think, are regulated by the FDA. Um, again, this is a thing where new people come in over time and learn how to use them and how not to use them. And, um, I mean, doctors, that is, I mean, um, and doctors will sort of prescribe them in a way, um, or suggest that patients take them. But they're not studied through. They haven't been. There are probably some studies on them, but they haven't passed through the formal clinical trial process. Thank you, Josh, so much.